Hi, my name is Mike, and I'm one of the pastors here at Kings Harbor. Thank you so much for joining us for this online message. Here's our hope that as you hear the word of God preached, that you would see Jesus more clearly and love him more deeply. And so over the next few moments, take notes, focus, and hear how the word of God is going to transform you. Church, good morning. Um, as, as we get ready to get started, we're going to be in the book of Acts chapter 16. Um, let, me, let me say a few things. Uh, I, am, I am stoked for us. And so uh, if you are a parent of a kid in our children's ministry, uh, you probably received an email over the last several days about how we are uh, moving into a new unit of our curriculum. Or if you were here early and you saw the, the announcements, or if you were watching online and you saw the announcements and you saw this graphic about the gospel project, or even if you were checking in and you saw, wait a minute, there's something different on that wall. Like we're, our kids are getting ready to start a new unit uh, uh, in the gospel project, and I'm super excited about it. Um, they're going to be in Genesis, and so they'll be walking through Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and in a few weeks they'll be walking in Genesis 3. Uh, I'm just going to see if I can volunteer because everybody knows how much I like to talk about Genesis 3. Um, and so I'm excited about that. I'm excited this, this week our, our students uh, come back to, for student ministry. Uh, and this past Thursday, we were uh, at an offsite and we were planning, thinking, recreating, reinventing, thinking about ways that we could do things differently for our students. And we're excited about what's to come, some ways that uh, we're just going to inject new life and fun into what we're doing with our students. Um, this, we, we already heard Brian talk about that uh, men's retreat's coming, women's conference is coming. It just feels like we've gotten to the fall. And like I know if you were like glued to your TV yesterday watching college football. Uh, like it's, it's already a kind of kickoff season, but it feels like it's a kickoff season for us as well. Then I'll even say this. If you're a 20 something or 30 something this, this afternoon at Deep Portolo Park, we just, we just want to have an opportunity to hang out with you. And so Nate, if you'll stand up and raise your hand, if you're in your twenties or thirties and you're like, man, I'd like to hang out, man, you're lovable, likable. People got excited. <laughs> now let me, let me clarify. Because there was somebody on staff this week that when they heard that this was going on on and Instagram said, well, how in your 30s do you need to be? He was asking for a friend. And he got zero response. I'm a little offended by that. He's a little bit offended by that. He told me that. And so let me say this. If you are in your 30s, but like in your 30s means that you've had your 39th birthday for the 17th time, you are not invited and so 20s and 30s, if you're looking to connect, here's an opportunity to do that. And so uh, at 1 o'clock at Deep Portolo, you don't, you don't have to sign up. But if you want to know somebody, because it's always better to know that somebody's there to welcome you and receive you because they know that you're coming, go see Nate. He'd love to, he'd love to help you get connected uh, in that way. So all of that, there's a ton going on, and I'm excited about all of it. And that's not the reason, that I, like, that's not even the responsibility that I have this morning of preaching. But I'll say this, next weekend is Celebration Weekend, and in the evening we have our Celebration Weekend gathering. And some of the things that I mentioned, we're just going to talk about in detail. We're going to celebrate our mission trip that's going to Jackson, Mississippi at the start of October. There's just a whole lot of stuff going on. So, like, like I am really, no, be fired up about that. That's all right, Rob. Uh, and so... I want to invite you. Like, maybe you're like, should I go? Should I not go? You should go. And then you'll get to hear more about these things. So there you go. Teaser. Acts chapter 16. I, I love this text. Um, when I was in Dallas leading a young adult ministry, uh, the Lord started doing something in my heart about missions, about planting. And, and uh, we preached through, we ultimately were going to preach through the book of Philippians, but we spent four weeks in Acts 16, and it became one of my favorite texts that I've, I've ever gotten to preach. And then uh, a few years back, Dan Bradford and I got to go uh, to a Christian university and be part of a missions conference. Uh, and I remember I, I was teaching in, in a session and what, like the toughest professor at that university came in and she said, well, what, when you think about what the Lord's doing in missions, what's your favorite text? And I was like, Acts 16. And she's like, do you mean Acts 17 where Paul's at Athens and the Areopagus? I was like, no, 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 no. I'm in Acts 16 where he follows the leading of the spirit wherever the spirit would take him to go. I was like, you thought you got me, but I'm not one of your students. I was ready for this. And then I love it because nearly five years ago, when I was here for my candidate weekend, the text that I chose to preach that weekend was Acts 16, because it gave me an opportunity to just declare to you, this is the church that I hope we can become together. And so uh, this text is sentimental for me, um, but it's, I, I'm praying that it's powerful for you. 
And so with that in mind, I'm, I'm thinking about my, my beginnings here, but I'm also just thinking about uh, moments in life where I've watched other people go through their beginnings. And so growing up, I went to a church called Crossroads Cathedral. They changed the name to Crossroads Church uh, of Oklahoma City. Uh, and, and I remember there was a transition in the lead pastor. And I actually had left being on staff and left attending that church when that happened. Uh, but the man who became lead pastor, his name was Gary Bohannon. And so I drove back from Dallas to see his installation service, and they had like boats on the stage, and the kind of theme was, will you get in and row with us where we're going? And it was cool and thematic, uh, and they had people celebrating him, they had slideshows, all, all types of stuff. And then he got up to speak, and he started out by saying, I kind of feel like the dog that caught the car. Now I don't know what to do with it. And he said, I don't, I don't know if I'm the leader that you need. But here's what, he, he's, here's what I know, and here was, was his statement. Lord, the only way that I could be a great leader is if I can be a faithful follower. And all these years later, I remember that. like it's, it's seared into my mind, and I think it's important because as we look at Acts 16, we're going to see something unique here that, that Paul, who's known for his leadership initiative and the churches that he plants and the apostolic gifting, that it's as much his ability to follow the leading of the Spirit as it is any ability that he has to lead that the Lord's using. And so here's our main idea. The early church is not just a template for courage against resistance. Uh, we've talked about over and over again that one of the themes of the book of Acts is that there's this grace against re resistance. It's this inevitability of opposition and the ability by the grace and the spirit of God to overcome that. But it's not just a template for that. It's also the display of the humility and flexibility necessary for the gospel to flourish in new context. And so here's where we'll be. Verses one through five, we'll look at the humility to concede and then in verses 6 through 10, we'll look at the humility to adapt. Let's pray one more time. We'll jump in. Jesus, I thank you. I, I mentioned it before, but I'll say it again. You speak like no other. And so over the next few moments, would you speak to our hearts in a way that couldn't be studied out or planned or developed, but is only what your spirit is doing in real time in the hearts of a unique set of people in a unique moment in time. So speak to us in that type of way. It's your name we pray. Amen? Acts chapter 16, verse 1. What's that is? Oh, one more thing. One more thing. Acts study guide. One, give a round of applause to your group's team and your communications team. Because they, like with part two, did a stellar job of putting together part three. And so if you don't have one of these, uh, feel free to grab them. I was going to have like an Oprah moment and like throw it to somebody and be like, you get a guide, you get a guide, but it's not really a gift because they're free. So like, I mean, you could just go grab one. So it's really not that, it's not special in that way, but it is very valuable. So Acts chapter 16, verse one, let's say this. Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer and his father was a Greek. He was, a well, he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decision that had been, uh, that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. And I think it's important because it's been a while since we've been in Acts uh, to, to, to work a little bit backwards here. And so the last thing that Luke says here, and it'll be interesting because Luke is the writer of Acts, and this is actually in just a few moments, we're going to see Luke, we're going begin, to begin to see these kind of first person plurals. So he's putting himself in the story. He's, he's part of it at this moment. Luke it makes a statement at the very end of those verses that we read that the churches were strengthened and they added to their numbers daily. And so let's back up to May where we left off. And where we left off was that there was this decision made about who could be in and who could be out. And then Paul and Barnabas decided that they needed to go strengthen the churches. And the work of strengthening the churches was to go back and say, share the decision of the grace that the Lord had given both to the Jew and the Gentile. And so that seems to be accomplished. But let's take another step back. He said that they accomplished this by, by sharing for observance the decision that was made. So what was the decision that was made? Acts chapter 15, uh, starting in verse 23, there's a letter that's been given. Uh, Paul, Barnabas, Silas, uh, uh, Judas, 
not that Judas, different Judas, uh, were going to share the, the message of what the, had been decided by the Jerusalem council. And here's what it says. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, you will do well. Farewell. And so what they're writing, there's been this question all the way since back in Acts chapter 10, where the Spirit's moving against people, amongst people that it's like, um, wait a minute, you don't check all the boxes. You don't keep our traditions. You don't worship like we do. You don't, you don't have the same holidays as us. And so there's been this tension because the, the, the church is growing, the church is moving. Paul and, and Barnabas have gone to places where they're primarily Gentile and begin to preach the word and seeing people come to faith. The, it seems like the headquarters of what God's doing has moved from Jerusalem to Antioch. And yet there's this question, is it okay for the Lord to be doing this? And so chapter 15, we see the settling of the question and they say, hey, we're just giving you three requirements and, and here's a way that you can kind of put those requirements together. Like abstain from things that are idolatry. And so oftentimes the way that things were strangled or prepared to eat, the way that things were sacrificed or even the way that people use their sexual identity were part of their idol worship of whatever deity of the area. And he would say, they would say, if you back away from those things, or maybe let me say it this way, if you have no other God than the triune God who rescued your soul from sin, then if you would commit to him above all else, you'll do well. And so why am I taking all this time to tell you this? One, to, if you hadn't been with us for the first two parts of the series, to catch you up a little bit. But two, because it makes what Paul does with Timothy kind of odd. So it says this in verse three, that Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So wait a minute, Paul is carrying this message of, hey, you don't have to do this. People who are troubling and unsettling your mind saying that you're not fully a believer in Jesus Christ if you don't go through this surgical procedure. Like, that's the point that he's going. He wants Timothy to go with him on the trip to strengthen the churches with this message. He says, before we go, hey, bro, we're going to have to do this. Like, if you read the book of Galatians, like, Paul is serious about this should not be a burden that you put on people's shoulders, that you shouldn't take a tradition and make it next to godliness and somehow say, you have to do this to be part of the people of God. And yet... When he had an opportunity with somebody that he saw something in and that he wanted to raise up, that he would do something that he doesn't believe had to be done. Think about that level of humility. He, he had not just the, the standing, the right, but he, he won the argument for lack of a better term. He had the letter from the apostles and the elders. Like he did not have to do this. And yet, because he didn't want anything to get in the way of the gospel, he didn't want Timothy to not be well received. He was willing to lay down what he preferred and concede to a tradition that he didn't think is necessary so that nothing would get in the way of the gospel. What would, what would that look like today? What would that look like for you? I remember when I was leading young adult ministry, um, not that you need to know this about me, but I, I, I'm a teetotaler. I don't drink. I'm not judging you if, you if you drink responsibly. I don't think that's necessarily sin, but I don't, especially when I was leading college students because whatever I did in moderation, they were going to do in excess. And so I had a young man in our ministry. I won't tell you his name because I don't want to embarrass him, but he had lost his job 
was struggling mightily, had battled alcoholism, and he had gone to a local bar right down the street from our church. And his girlfriend texted me and said, hey, he's in there. I don't know what to do. And I was like, it's going to look awkward that the pastor's walking out of a bar later on. But I'm going to go in there and get him. And so I go in there and I get him. And he's like, well, I'm drinking whether you're drinking or not. And I'm like, like, my, like my approval meter is like, I can't do this. Like, what if somebody from the church sees me? Which, if somebody from the church sees me in the bar, it's a whole different conversation, right? And so I was like, all right, dude, I'm going to get a water. You get a drink. I'll even pay for it. We're going to have to talk. And so, like, I'm freaking out. Like, 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 this is completely against my rule, my code of conduct. And so I'm sitting there having this conversation with him. We're talking about Johnny Cash. He's crying. Like, I, this is the strangest conversation, but yet the Lord's moving in it. And at the end of the conversation, I'm like, hey, man, I'm proud of you. We've been together for like two hours, and you've only had one drink. And he's like, well, I had five before you got here, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> and the Lord used that in his life. Because I was willing to go somewhere that I wouldn't normally want to go and be seen in a place that I was scared to be seen and to lower uh, a, a conviction, I should, I should say. And, and I say conviction in quotes because I, I think that's more about me than it's necessarily about what the scriptures would specifically say to enter in and go get somebody with the gospel. What would that look like for you? What would that look like for our church? Like I told you, I love this text because it gives us an opportunity to examine ourselves and say, Lord, help us to be that. Like, like what, would, what could we lay down? What could we change? What could we open our hands up and say, Lord, I'm willing to give that up if, if, it, if it doesn't stop us from being able to proclaim the gospel to those that may not hear? Or give us the opportunity to enter into lives that are broken in a way that we wouldn't if we said we're going to hold this up. And, and so I love that like, Paul isn't laying down something that's an, a matter of sin. He is laying down something that's a matter of tradition. And he's willing to lay down that tradition to reach somebody who hasn't been reached or to utilize somebody who's gifted. Let me ask a second question. Who is it around you that you see that there's something in that you're willing to? to take a little bit of a hit for your reputation to give them an opportunity. Like he knows that, that he has a, he's got a mixed background, that he's both Jewish and Greek, and that there's going to be uh, some tension amongst the Jews about his background. And Paul still wants him so badly to be a part of what he's doing that he's either going to have to deal with people being frustrated because this, Jew, this half Jew, half Greek kid isn't circumcised, or he's going to look like he's a hypocrite doing the thing that he said you don't have to do. And who is it around you that the Lord's given you the grace to see that you'll stick out your neck a little bit farther for them? Who's it around you that discipleship is not just reading a book or studying a study, but it's saying, I'll put a little bit of me on the line that, that you could stand on my shoulders and get to the place that the Lord is sending you? Both of these things take humility. They take the humility to, instead of being more, being less, the humility to concede. And then second, 6 through 10 says this. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go. So you see Luke and entering himself in the story. We sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so I just, let me, let me really quickly recap that for you. They happened to be in Phrygia and Galatia going through that region because they wanted to go to Asia and the spirit said no. And then they're like, okay, we're going to go to Mysia and Bithynia. That's, the, that's where we're going instead. And the spirit said no. And then out of nowhere, Paul has this dream of this Macedonian man that's like, hey, come preach here. And then Luke's like, I, I think we're supposed to go there. 
Like, I would think that if somebody showed up in a dream and said to you, hey, I need you to go to Hermosa and stand on the pier and preach the gospel. Like, I don't think you'd be like, I, I mean, maybe I should do that. But think about what lack of confidence you would have if you just felt like you missed it twice. Like if you thought you were supposed to go to Asia and you couldn't go to Asia, if you thought you were supposed to go to Bithynia and Mysia and you couldn't go there, like think about the lack of confidence and the humility that would create in you. Think about Silas. Because if we go back to where we were in Acts 15, here's what happens. Paul and Barnabas believe that the churches should be strengthened and Barnabas wants to take John Mark with him and Paul says, no, he left us before. We can't take him with us and they part ways over that. And, and Paul chooses Silas to go with him. And so now Silas and Timothy and Luke are going with Paul. Paul, this great apostle who's led churches, who has confidence in the Lord, who got stoned in one city, got up and walked out on his own. Like, it's that guy. He got your little bag packed for Phrygia, got your um, Hebrew to Phrygian little hand dictionary so you can figure out where the bathroom is and how to ask for food. <laughs> and halfway there, Paul's like, I don't think the Spirit's going to let us go all right, I'll give you one. Let's go to Bithynia. All right, let me change my stuff. Bithynia is hot this time of year. Let me get my Bithynian short, my, my Bithynian fit on. I'm ready. Got my dictionary. Let's go. Wait a minute. The Spirit's saying we, couldn't go, we can't go there either? At this point, I'm in the back of the car texting Barnabas. Uh, how come you didn't tell me that Paul can't read a map? Is there still room on your team? Can I, can I slide in by John Mark? Because I, I don't know that this guy gets it. But what if following the Spirit isn't this bold stake of I know exactly what's going on, but what if it's this humility to try and to fail? Think about how freeing that might be for you. I, I, I have felt this and I've sat with others that have had this conversation. They feel that the Lord's calling them to do something, but they're not exactly sure what or where or how. And so they're just kind of paralyzed because they, they have to get it right. And maybe these two stories go together in this way. The thing that makes you part of the people of God, the thing that makes you secure in your faith is not the fact that you did the right thing but instead that Jesus on your behalf has done all that needs to be done. And so now there is this freedom for you. And now there's this, this following after the spirit where the spirit leads. And that may not be as simple as it sounds. When I used to lead young adults, I would say it this way. Sometimes the hardest thing about following Jesus is following Jesus. Because sometimes to follow Jesus means going to places that you wouldn't go or doing things that you wouldn't do. But sometimes following Jesus means that you don't get the full picture. Because maybe you are like me. If Jesus gave me steps A through Z, then I'm trying to skip over B through Y. And, I, and oftentimes my, my burden to get to the end of the process or get to the end of the project or get to the destination, I miss what he's trying to do in me because I'm just trying to get the thing done. So sometimes the spirit slows us down and says, no, 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 not yet. Not there. Not that way. Maybe some of you have been beating yourselves up because you're like, okay, I feel like the Lord's calling me to this set of people or this type of activity, and I tried, and it went over like a lead balloon. I, I remember being in college. I feel like I shared this in 11 last week, but I don't think I shared it with you guys. I was in college, and the Lord was doing some really cool things in my heart through a campus ministry called Chi Alpha. And I felt emboldened to begin to pray for people to be healed. And so I was at the University of Oklahoma campus, the way that the campus lays out, um, there's the campus and then there is the basketball stadium that you have to ride a shuttle bus to get to, but you could park there for free. And I was a poor college student, so I was parking for free every time I could. And so at the bus stop every Tuesday and Thursday, there was a young man who was blind. And I felt like the Lord was asking me to pray for him to be healed. And so, Thursday came, and he and I are at the bus stop together. And to my shame, I'm trying to avoid this conversation in every way I possibly can. I don't want him to know that I'm there. I don't want to have a conversation. I certainly don't want him to ask me to pray for him, and then I pray and I fail. 
in the kindness of the Lord, I get on the shuttle bus, and the only seat on the shuttle bus is right next to him. He had a cast on his left hand. I remember it specifically. And I remember asking him, hey, can I pray for you for anything? To which he responded, no, I don't believe in that. Which internally, I'm like, see, Lord, that's why I was trying to avoid this. <laughs> and it just felt like the spirit was like, no, don't stop. And I was like, well, well, I just, I'm a believer in Jesus, and I believe that he can enter into anything and help with anything. Is there anything that I can pray for? The obvious elephant in the room. And he's like, if you, got, if you need to do your thing, pray for my hand. And I was like, okay, well, that's, that's not how I thought this was going to go. But all right, I pray for a hand. And so I start praying. I pray for his hand. And since I'm already there, we're all the way in. I might as well just go for his eyes as well. So I'm like, Lord, and then if you want to heal his blindness, like you can heal his blind. Like anything you want to do in this moment, you can do. And then nothing happened. He couldn't see. His cast didn't come off. He didn't come to the Lord. None of it. And yet in that moment, there was something about following the spirit, even when I had no confidence or ability, that maybe had more to do with me than ever had to do with him. I don't know. Maybe, well, maybe on the other side of glory, I'm going to be standing, waiting to get in line in the pearly gates. I don't think that's a thing, but that's, it's, a, it's a cultural concept, so let's go with it. And I bump into this guy in his glorified body with eyes that can see and a hand that's not in a cast. I don't know if the Lord's ever going to give me that. But what I know is that I learned something about following the Lord, even when I had no confidence, that was better than just getting the end result. And I love this humility to adapt and experiment and stumble. What would that look like for us as a church? What would it look like if maybe there's some things that we tried and we thought, oh, the Lord's in this. And then it was like, no, he went in that. And maybe the timing was off or, or the, the methodology was off. And what if we entered into that again? Or what if the Lord was calling us to adapt and shift and try some things in ways that we've never tried them before? What if the prayer that was ever on our congregation's lips was, Spirit, I think this is you. Protect us if we're wrong. I long for us to be a church like that. So let me go back to our main idea. The early church is not just a template for courage against resistance. It is a display of the humility and flexibility necessary for the gospel to flourish in new context. The Apostle Paul, this isn't like a blip on the radar for him. This is a philosophy of the way that he lived. Uh, you, if you've been around church uh, for any period of time, you've probably heard somebody say, I became all things to all people. And, and in some ways, in the wrong context, used in the wrong way, that's really dangerous. Because that means you're running around and not being who you are. You're, you're being this chameleon trying to fit. But that's not what he's saying. And so here's the context in which he says that. 1 Corinthians 9. I'm going to read the, this latter part of verse 12, and then we'll skip to 19. Uh, in there, he's, he's illustrating the way that he's doing what he's saying, but uh, for, for sake of directness, I'm going to just skip down to 19 after I read 12. He says this, Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right. He's talking about the right to pay, the right to, th to being taken care of in ministry. But we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Verse 19, For though I am free from all, I've made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being, not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside of the law, not being outside of the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. And I've become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessing. Here's what I hear there. Humility. 
I hear this willingness to lay down what he could rightfully say I'm entitled to. That this willingness to say, though I don't have to follow that tradition, I'll enter into the tradition if it makes you comfortable enough that we can have a conversation about Jesus. And for you who is far from Jesus and aren't willing to have that conversation yet, I, I, I'll come and sit in your backyard and we can watch the game and we'll watch as many games as it takes to get to the place that I can have the conversation with you about Jesus. To the weak, I'll become weak. To all people, I'll become whatever is necessary under the glory of God that, you, that I might save some. I long for that to be my heart. I long for my engagement with the world around me not to be on my own terms, but be on the terms of what is necessary for me to be humble enough that I might be kind enough to enter into where somebody is at. I long for that for you. I long for that for our church. This humility, this flexibility. And so let me... Let me speak to that a little bit more directly. When I was on paternity leave, uh, the beauty of paternity leave is you have a small child that, is, that needs you to hold his head up, and so you can't do much else but think. And so at night, I'd sit, I would think, I would pray. And Luke chapter 14 I talked about it a little bit last week. We'll talk about it a little bit more in the future. There's this language of being compelled to go to the highways and the hedges. And it's the story of this great banquet that Jesus is inviting people to. And they're like, I, got, I just got married. I just got a field. Like all these other reasons not to, to be there. And Jesus makes this, makes this statement through this parable about this idea of, well, what if we went after something different? What if we pursued something different? And it rattled me. Because I sat listening to what I felt like the Lord was saying through the scriptures and wrestled with, have we just played it safe and done what we've always known? I, I think that, uh, yeah. So I lead a team called Liturgy and Digital Content. So thinking about our services, thinking about what we produce in terms of uh, outfacing digital content. And we did an exercise where we talked about uh, the church's brand personality. So if the church was a guy at a party or a gal at a party, what would they be like? And one of the members of the team was like, we would be wearing a conservative polo shirt, nice jeans, and an outdated Apple Watch. And then I looked at my wrist at my outdated Apple Watch. I was like, that felt kind of personal. <laughs> we would be good listeners, but we wouldn't enter into converse, controversial conversations. We'd be somebody that you wanted to be around, but we wouldn't be the life of the party. And, and I'm, I wrestle with, have we missed an opportunity to enter in with people because we've been cautious and serious and morose and missed an opportunity to have fun. Missed an opportunity to tell people, hey, there's joy in following Jesus. Like if all it is is sitting in a room listening to a guy with a face mic, this is a really lame hobby. Like you should get a boat or go hiking or do something else. But if there's joy in being formed together with these people, if there's opportunity to enter into spaces and say that when we enter in, we bring the light of the gospel and push back darkness. Like if that's a possibility, if we could see broken people come alive and be healed and become well, and so therefore we enter into kickball leagues because playing kickball gives us an opportunity to get into gospel, then let's start a kickball team. Like if it, if it means that on Wednesday nights with our students that has got to get a little bit zany and crazy and we somehow figure out how to get like a water slide from outside into the seats so they can worship from there, then let's do that. If it means that we've got to turn it up a little bit louder. So I, I warned you. So when that happens, don't like come to me with your phone, with your like, your, like with your sound meter being like, well, it's over 90 decibels. I warned you. Like, like what if? What if we decide, well, hey, you know what? 
There is communities all around us. Do you know that like in the last year, there have been uh, either a campus or churches planted in either South Torrance and PV. But if you look at Carson, if you look at Pedro, if you look at Long Beach, nobody wants to go there. Like what if the Lord's saying, hey, there's all this space to play, but you can't just do what you've always done. It's gonna take the humility to lay some things down. It's gonna take the humility to be able to adapt. But when you do, the gospel can flourish in new places. Four years ago, I shared this text because it was me introducing to you what I hoped we would become. And today I feel the conviction to do the same. What if the Lord's inviting us into a whole new frontier? And the question is, will you go? Can we be humble enough to stumble through? We're going to try things and we're going to miss it. We're going to try things and they're going to end up on blooper reels years from now. Be like, remember the time that we tried that thing? Really, really bad. (laughs) And then there are going to be things that we stumble into and we're like, that wasn't even what we were going for. And Lord, you did so much more with it than we could have ever imagined. But it takes the humility to say, oh, man, we missed it with Bithynia and Mysia, but you had something in Macedonia for us and we needed to go through that process to get there. So what does it look like for you to ask the spirit of God to give you the humility and the flexibility to go where the spirit leads? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for your mercy upon us that what you have assured us by your death and resurrection is that you win, that you will accomplish your purposes, that you don't need us to, to throw a perfect game for you to achieve what you want to achieve, that in our frailty and our stumbling and our failing, you still are going to get the glory you deserve. Lord, I thank you that you in your, your kindness and your mercy have invited us into something knowing how imperfect we are and you're giving us space by your grace to, to learn, to mold, to experiment, to fail and to trust you all the more. And so it's not a surprise to you, but Lord, would you give us the courage to embrace that? Give us the courage to embrace where we think you might be up to something, but but maybe we missed it. Or or we think that you're leading us a direction, and as we go, we find out, well, it's not the right timing, or it's not not the right way. And so, uh, Lord, give us the humility to see ourselves as we truly are, and then trust you to use even that. So I long for us to become a people of flexibility, a people of humility, a people who ever confess, Spirit, we think this is you. Protect us where we might be wrong. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Again, thanks for watching this message online. And here's our hope, that you didn't just hear the word of God, but that it compels you to follow the way of Jesus. Here's what we mean by that. We're not just giving you information, but we believe that there's steps that you take afterwards to obey Jesus, to serve the world around you, to give sacrificially, and to go to others who haven't heard the message. And so one, we would love to know you, particularly if you're in the Southern California area. If you go to kingsharbor.org slash hello, you can send us a digital connect card, and we would love to follow up with you, just get to know you better. But we also hope that you didn't just hear a message and then just stow it away somewhere, but it compels you to obey and follow the way of Jesus. Uh, We pray that you do that in community. That's the best way to live this out. You can live it out. We just don't believe you should live it out alone. Uh, On top of that, we we believe that this is an opportunity to serve. And whether that's you serving uh, the church or the community around you, that those who follow Jesus reflect Jesus by the way that they serve. Then we would ask that you give. Giving is not something that is uh, just kind of a tradition in the church. It's evidence that you fully trust Jesus in every dimension of your life. And then finally, we're praying that you go. 
that you would share this with someone else, that if the Lord has impacted you by his word to see Jesus better and love him more deeply, that you'd invite others to do the same by either sharing this message with them or entering into community with them and sharing what the Lord has done. So we're excited to hear from you, to connect with you, and to hear about what the Lord's doing through his word and in your life.